All right, well, wait just a second, a couple of seconds here to let everyone get connected up. All right, thank y'all so much for joining us today um, on this pretty sunny day, but it's a little bit chilly out there, but you yeah. know, it finally, <laughs> we're talking about how it's finally feeling like winter today. Um, I'm Vanessa with the Dallas Public Library. Uh, we host this Grow With Us series in conjunction with the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Uh, we talk about all topics, gardening, um, growing things, all the things you want to learn. And uh, one of the things we want to, <laughs> we're all thinking about the new year is we're just talking, I was just talking about Drew before we started about seed catalogs. So we're all thinking about our seeds and what we need to start planting now and what we need to start starting indoors pretty soon. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Drew. This is Drew Dimmler with Big Tech's Urban Farms. He's an amazing gardener and farmer. Uh, and the Big Tech's Urban Farms is an amazing program that, um, you know, not only grows food uh, for the state fair, but it grows food year round for um, people in the community too. So I'll let Drew talk a little bit more about that and what he does and um, get started by talking about seeds. So you want to <laughs> take it over, Drew? Yeah, sure. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't have any big fancy presentation here uh, for y'all today. I'm just gonna kind of talk about what I've done seed starting um, and you know what we, what we still do, and you know go over some things that are appropriate to seed start right now. Um, and I do have a couple catalogs we could talk about where to get certain things and supplies and stuff. Also, um, to start with, just right quick for those of you who may not know me, my name is Drew Dimmler. I'm the Director of Horticulture for the Great State Fair of Texas, and um, I'm in charge of a really cool program called the the Big Tex Urban Farms, um, where we grow produce uh, primarily now hydroponically in an indoor greenhouse, and donate all of the produce to different nonprofit groups in South Dallas. Um, if you don't know much about us, uh, you can find out about us on the our website. It's at bigtex.com. Um, let's talk about planting seeds. Um, First off, let's talk about what it's a good time to be planting. And uh, I know it's like we were saying, it's finally cold outside today. Uh, so it may not seem like it right away, but spring is right around the corner. And if you were wanting to, uh, if you were wanting to start your warm weather crops from seed, this is really the time to start doing it, believe it or not. Um, so we're talking about things like, in particular, peppers and tomatoes, um, because both of those are can be a little slow uh, starting from a seed. So it, it's time to go ahead and get those started. In fact, uh, you're definitely not too late. Um, but in years past, I've started my peppers and tomatoes even in late December, uh, sometimes mid to late December, as soon as I could get my hand on seed. Um, Important to know with with both uh, with, with both of those and, and and other crops too. This time of year, we are talking about starting seeds in an indoor or some type of an enclosed setting. Um, so if you have a backyard greenhouse that you're able to keep warm on the cold days, uh, that's certainly fantastic. If not, um, and I've done this many times, you can start them either in a garage or even in your house. Um, sometimes when you're starting seeds in indoors, depending on your exact circumstances, you may need to add supplemental lighting. Um, and I'll get more into that in just a second, uh, cause there are some recommendations I have for that. There's some lights that I found that I like really, really well, um, for this purpose. Um, but anyway, so yeah, primarily you're, you're looking at starting your, your warmer weather crops, uh, this time of year, and like I say, doing it in a in a protected environment. Um, also, though, you can absolutely plant even some of your your greens that you may be wanting to plant sooner than that. Um, so, primarily, when we're talking about peppers and tomatoes, and uh, maybe even things like basil, eggplant, if that's something you like to grow, that where you're going to be planting those out in spring, you know, after the last chance of frost. Um, there's still plenty of opportunity to be planting other types of greens between now and then. Um, and if you want to start those from seed, I would still recommend starting those indoors and letting them grow out a little bit more. Um, get a good, a good transplant going before you, you set them out in the garden, just to make sure that they're going to be able to, to tolerate uh, some of the cold. They have some roots. They're going to be able to tolerate the cold. So 
you could be doing things like kale and arugula. Uh, collard greens would be a really good one. Um, might be getting a little bit late for cabbage, uh, but you could give those a try. And certainly broccoli. This would be a great time to be planting broccoli um, and getting those transplants ready for your, your spring your spring transplant and harvest. Um, about the only thing I, I really don't recommend starting, uh, this is just my personal preference. I know I, I know people who, who do this, but uh, a lot of your root crop vegetables, um, I prefer to get those into the ground um, just straight away from a seed where you're gonna direct sow, what we call direct sow those into the garden. Um, I've had problems in years past, especially with carrots, um, where you, you start them in a transplant and that taproot wants to develop and it can get kind of messed up in the, in the seed trays, uh, depending on what you're, what you're starting with, um, where they can kind of deform the roots. And I've had the same thing happen with, with some of the larger root crop vegetables. So for the most part, I would recommend just direct seeding those. Um, that's cheap and easy enough to do. Um, but certainly all of your other kinds of greens, you could, you could be getting those uh, started as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about setups. Um, I've done it many different ways. And uh, another, another time I could probably give like a long form presentation about getting tomatoes ready for the spring. But to, today we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what, what I've done as far as seed starting. Um, I'm, very blessed to have you know access to greenhouses so I've certainly started those in, in in greenhouses where we would have to heat them you know on the on the cold days and then you know ventilate them properly on the warmer days because believe it or not it can get really hot inside of a greenhouse even in the winter time on the sunnier days um, and we all know we certainly get our our uh, our fair share of uh, of warm weather during the winter also right um, so that's a great, you know, if you have a, a hobby greenhouse or access to a greenhouse, of course, that's going to give you a real advantage um, as far as starting your seeds. But if you don't, that's not a big deal. Um, you can, again, as I mentioned earlier, you can simply start them indoors. Um, I would recommend using what's called a bottom watering tray. Uh, and that's simply just to makes less mess. And what a bottom watering tray is, like once you get your, your, your plants up and growing um, in whatever seed uh, starting trays you're gonna use, um, it's basically almost like a pan that holds water and your plants in their trays are gonna sit on top of this pan. And what you do, it, you know, a couple times a week, you'll just add water to the bottom of the reservoir and the plant roots will wick that water up. Um, it's just a very clean and easy way to grow. Um, I've certainly done it other ways where I'd have to like take my plants to the sink and water them in the sink so the water doesn't run all over the place. Um, but the bottom watering trays make it super duper easy. Um, I've also started my transplants in all different types of pots. Um, I've started them in, in proper what's called plug trays where there's about 72 plants on a tray. Um, I've done them in the six pack containers that I'm sure you've all seen. I, I really like to use those because they've got a longer, uh, a little bit longer uh, container. So for developing a really good root system, I've done four inch pots, which is probably the most common thing that I've used for seed starting before. Um, all of them work just fine. I've even started seeds directly in one gallon containers. Um, primarily I, I use uh, four inch containers though, just because that's what I had easiest access to. Um, they're usually cheap and easy to find. Um, I'll go over sourcing on some stuff in just a minute. Um, soil, and this is very important. You're gonna need to use a good quality potting soil. Um, I use a product called Berger number no. seven. Um, it can be kind of hard to find. Um, there's also another mix that I've used and like really well called Metro mix. And I know there's even, there's even other organic soils um, that I've used out there. Uh, North Haven Gardens 
um, in North Dallas has a really good seed starting mix, a good potting soil mix. Um, and there's other products out there. There's not, there's not one that I'm necessarily in love with, but you do want to, this is one area where it, it, it really does pay off in the long run to get a good quality mix. This is something where it's worth spending an extra couple of dollars. If you're serious about getting your, uh, your seed started and off to a good start. I have used four mixes in the past where I've gone to the nursery and just bought the cheapest, you know, potting mix that they had or whatever. And I tell you what, man, it really makes a difference because by the time the seeds would get up and growing, and especially when they were developing their first true leaves, you could just see they were yellowing out and uh, showing a lot of nutrient deficiencies. And you either end up having to uh, fertilize them extra uh, to, to, to green them up or transplant them into something else that has a, a, a better nutrient mix to it. So that's one area right there where it's, it's definitely worth uh, spending the, the extra money, in my opinion. Um, as far as uh, the, the containers, like I say, just use whatever you can find. Um, there's a, a couple of, I went and got some of my seed catalogs and we were talking about this. These guys here, Johnny's, um, they're a seed source and they have a number of really great varieties. Um, they have a website and phone number um, that you can get on and they do a free catalog. And in the back of their catalog, um, they have a supply section and they have a, just a number of really great supplies. Like this is, this is an example. It might be kind of hard to see on the screen, but you can see all the different types of seed trays that they, that they sell. Um, all of these are, are, are good to use. So that's one possible source for supplies. Um, they have every, everything you would need. Um, these guys are also another, another good source for, uh, for supplies. Um, they're great too, but I've certainly, I've, I've found things locally. I've found things at, uh, at Home Depot before, certainly a lot of the, the garden centers these days uh, are, are selling these supplies and I would expect you're probably going to start seeing all of that stuff uh, get onto the shelves here pretty soon. Um, you know, I think most of those places have kind of done the Christmas tree lot thing and uh, I've noticed a lot of that stuff is clearing out now um, and, and now they're, they're making room and getting their, their supplies in. So you're probably going to start seeing fresh seeds and, uh, and all of the seed starting supplies. Um, there is one other thing I, I would recommend um, if you're, especially if you're, you're growing indoors, something that can help your, uh, your, your odds, so to speak, and, and help get proper germination is the use of something called a humidity dome, um, which is just a plastic cover that goes over the top of your seed tray. Uh, some people call it a hot cap um, and they're vented. Um, in fact, that was fortunate. This is a, this is a humidity dome. Um, so you're going to have, imagine this is like a seed tray, um, where you plug tray, whatever you're using, four inch pots, whatever size, once you get your, your seeds planted, you're going to cover them over with this, with this plastic humidity dome, like so. And what that does is it just traps humidity in and it also kind of raises the soil temperature, um, kind of helps get that soil warm and it's going to help get those seeds germinating uh, much faster. And important to know um, if you're going to use the dome, every so often you might need to just take it off and kind of pat it and get some of the extra moisture out. And usually once you get the seedlings germinating, um, once they're sprouted, a couple of days after that you're seeing life, um, go ahead and remove that cap because you don't want too much moisture on the baby seedlings. That can cause some issues. Um, and then also it, it can actually, again, it can get too warm uh, for some of the seeds, depending on, on exactly where you're growing. So once you get them up and going, at that point, you can go ahead and remove the, uh, the humidity dome. Um, 
let's talk about lighting also. Um, it may or may not be necessary depending on where you're growing. Um, if you're growing in a greenhouse, you don't need to worry about lighting. Um, you know, unless you have shade trees overhanging your spot or something. I've, I've sprouted them in greenhouses, anything and everything a million times. And I, I've never had to use supplemental lighting. Um, however, if you're growing in a home, um, if you have bright sunny windows, that might be plenty good enough. Um, if you're if you're getting if you're getting good sunlight through a, you know maybe you have like a sunroom or something like that, um, or like I say even just a an embankment of of open windows where you're getting good natural light, um, you should be just fine. Um, but in a lot of cases, you may not get enough light, and your plants will tell you. Um, pretty quick. Once they get up and germinating, pretty soon you'll know that they'll they'll start stretching and they'll start getting really leggy and and or they may show some discoloration. Um, and both of those are are good signs that you're you're not getting enough light. And in that case, you're probably going to want to need to add supplemental lighting. Um, there's a number of different products on the market. And again, both of both of these places sell them. Uh, they both sell uh, lighting kits that are available. There's other places out there too. Um, again, I have seen some lights locally here and there, uh, some seed starting lights, some grow lights. But there's one that I want to tell you about that I have found that is really good. It's really great for starting seeds. It's also really good for growing microgreens um, in a home setting. And they're they're cheap and, and, and easy to get too. And they're, they're called a Barina uh, T5 LED. And you can actually get them on Amazon. And it's B-A-R-R-I-N-A. -R -R um, and the, the T5, what they call a T5, which is just the size of the light. Uh, that model of LED is really great. I think you could, I forget the exact cost, but you can get four or five of them in a pack for around about $30, which is going to be enough to, uh, goodness, you could start a lot of, a lot of seeds, you know, that would cover a lot of square footage. And normally you want to mount the lights, you know, about a foot to a foot and a half above your, uh, your seedlings. There's a number of different innovative ways to do it. We grow on a grow rack in my greenhouse where we have like a shell, a bottom watering shelf system with the watering is, is all done automated and it doesn't need to be anything that fancy at all. Um, in fact, I've seen some people do some really cool setups in their home. Again, just using bottom watering trays um, like I'm talking about. And then just a little simple stand made out of PVC that can sit up on top of a uh, of a desk or a shelf, and uh, like I say, about 18 inches tall, and you're going to hang your uh, your light from that PVC stand, and uh, it would be hard it would be hard to do too much. But typically, over the course of of a standard like 1020 type tray, which is sort of standard sizing for for most uh, seed starting material, 10 by 20 inch. Um, if you could mount like two lights over the top of them, like I say, at about foot and a half, that's going to give you really good lighting. Um, and it's going to make it just a world of difference in your seed starting capabilities, your transplant producing capabilities. And they're very cheap to run too, uh, because they're, because they're LEDs and they've gotten better and better. And these are inexpensive ones anyway. Um, it wouldn't take much uh, electrical cost to uh, to run those. So that would be, uh, like I say, that's that's the model that I've seen that works really well. Again, there's probably tons of others that work just as good, um, but that's one I can personally recommend. Um, now, if you want to use light, let's talk a little bit about when and how long and that type of thing. Um, Primarily, you're not really going to need the, the light until your seeds start to sprout. Um, so you can don't need to worry about turning them on until until uh, 
you, you get germination. And once you get germination, pretty soon thereafter, you are going to want to go ahead and get that, those lights, uh, that supplemental light on them um, pretty quickly because they can stretch pretty fast. And once they start to stretch, it's tough to correct depending on, on what, what type of plant you're growing. Um, you have a little bit more leeway on things like tomatoes where they're vining crops. Um, but on some, especially some of the greens, they, they, can, they can get leggy on you real fast. So a couple days after they germinate, make sure you get the light on. Now, how long are you going to need to run them? That's a question that I get a lot. Unfortunately, every situation, again, is going to be a little bit different. But I always recommend people... Uh, starting with 12 hours just find you 12 hours in your day uh and go from there um that's that's usually a, a pretty good starting point and again the you're gonna have to uh you're gonna want to uh you're gonna want to to kind of monitor your plants and and see what they're looking like if there's if they're still stretching you may need to run them 14 16 hours depending on the the natural light and how long you keep your kitchen light on or wherever you're growing. Um, but start with 12 hours and, and, and see where that goes. Um, are we getting any questions in the, in the chat room? Not yet. Um, oh, Nancy Wilson uh, constant, uh, commented about um, soil mo moisture and dampening off. Um, I think that's what you're talking about, like making sure that uh, when you're using that humidity thing, right, that you, you don't over, over humidify your, your <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's definitely one of one of the concerns, and that's also one of the reasons that I, I recommend like a good clean potting soil mix too, because uh, you don't want to bring any diseases uh, in because that that can be a real problem. You know, whether wherever you're growing, if your seed's starting in a greenhouse or in a in an indoor setting. Um. A question I have, um, and you may be addressing this later, but, um, you know, as far as a light source, do you use a heat source too? Do you use heat mats to start your seeds at all? I have not. Um, there's, that's certainly a good option. Um, and that, that is something that a lot of people do use. I've, I have never done that. And, uh, I've, I've always had good enough, you know, pretty uniform germination from, from just about everything. So, yeah, if you were in a if you were in a rush, you know, or whatever, maybe maybe you get off to a late start, um, or you weren't able. To, I know we mentioned earlier how there's been seed shortages and, and so forth uh, going on, so maybe you couldn't get your seeds till later on in the season, and you were really anxious to get them up and going. Um, a heat mat might be a good option, but it's it's definitely not something that I consider necessary. Now, uh, heating, yes, uh, pretty pretty much. Uh, pretty much every where I've, I've seed started, I've, I've needed to supplement heat. Um, that's the one thing that's really nice about getting a good setup in your house. It's the same thing I tell people about growing microgreens. I'm like, man, you're already paying to modify the climate of your house anyway, right? So you might as well figure out a way to take advantage of that. Um, you know, and there's, like I say, pretty cheap and easy ways to, to get a setup going. Oh, and this is a good question for you because I know y'all do a lot of hydroponic growing um, at Big Tech Urban Farms, but do you have a seed recommendation for a more compact tomato plant for a hydroponic power garden? Oh man, that is a great question. Gosh, I, uh, there's a number of them out there. Gosh, I'm trying to remember there, there's a few names that, uh, of, of different varieties. And then there's another one that, that I want to mention. There were some that were specifically bred to be grown in containers. They're, they're called like, man, the name is escaping me. Like the, the tiny tumblers or something like that. I'll need to look that up. Um, and they make a, you know, it's a, a larger tomato than a cherry. It's not a, a full size beef steak, but they do make a decent sized tomatoes. Um, and I've seen them growing in hanging baskets. The, the, the Dallas Arboretum used to put them in their, uh, their trial gardens. Um, so you'll probably see them there uh, on the grounds, but those would be excellent. Also, this is worth looking into uh, both for a, a uh, especially for a, for a hydroponic tower. And yes, we, we grow them also, um, but in our outdoor gardens too, 
there's a really cool, uh, a really neat, uh, I guess, a, a program. This guy, guy calls it a project. Um, a guy named Craig LaHoulier started this project called the Dwarf Tomato Project. And he networked with a group of just backyard gardeners like us um, initially from around the world. And they started trading seeds and ideas and, and breeding tips and so forth. And they have bred just a huge line of uh, these dwarf tomatoes. Um, and they're, the cool thing about them is they're not the, they're, they're actually a, uh, a non-determinate variety. So they'll continue to produce. They just grow very, very slowly. Um, and there's a lot of like heirloom genetics in them. So there's all kinds of the wild colors. There's striped ones, there's green ones and red ones and so forth. Uh, those would be really good to try because there's some out there that can actually produce decent sized tomatoes. Um, and even some um, almost beef safe size. Uh, we grew a green one this past year called Green Giant, which was really cool. We did it in one of our, not in a tower, but in a, one of our hydroponic beds, and it did pretty good for us. Um, but those would be really good. I got my seeds from a company called Victory Seed. Uh, they're on the West Coast, and uh, that's a really neat seed company also. So that would be, any of those would, would be good varieties. Uh, again, I think they're called the Tiny Tumbler series. There's a few different ones. Uh, and then those, the dwarf tomato projects would be great to look into. Awesome. And I put links, I found a, a link to Craig LaHuyer's website and put that in the chat. Um, and is, is that, is it tasty tumbler? Is that the name of the cherry tomato you're talking about? Is it tasty tumbler? I, it's, it's like tiny tumbler or something like that. Okay. <laughs> it preserves me. Um, <laughs> And going to the lights, I know when I was looking for a grow light, it's very confusing because there's like this blue light and red light. And mm -hmm. is there any certain ones that, you know, are necessary? Is that necessary or is that just like a gimmick or, you know, what's, what's the best ones to pick out? So, and that's another thing I, I should have mentioned in regards to that, to the Barina light that I recommended. Yes, uh, that it is actually kind of important. Typically for full grown crops and, you know, because of how we grow, we, we get to learn a lot and experiment a lot about lighting um, because we're indoors, we're in a greenhouse. Um, so we, we utilize light throughout the year. Anyway, um, mostly when you're, when you're growing crops long-term, you're going to want something that has a lot of red light to it in particular for, for greens, for leafy greens. Um, but for seed starting, you want to have, a light that's a little bit heavier uh, on the blue spectrum. Um, and that's one thing that the, the, uh, the Barina lights, those Barina lights, that's why they're so good for the, for the microgreens and for seed starting is that they've got a little bit more of that blue spectrum in them. Um, another thing that's nice is it, it's also a, uh, what you call a full spectrum where it's going to produce a white light. So it's, it's easy to look at. So if you're going to have it in your house, you know, it, it just looks like a regular lamp or something. Um, whereas a lot of the lights that we use in our greenhouse are the kind of pinks or, or purple looking because it's at com it's just a combination of blue and red. Uh, the, the rest of the spectrum is eliminated. And uh, those can get a little loud. They can be kind of tough to look at. Might not be what you'd want in your house. So um where you're going to be around it all the time. I like them. I think they're cool looking, but a lot of people say that, you know, if you look at them too long, it can kind of irritate your eyes and so forth. They don't, they're, they're not harmful in any way. They don't produce any harmful radiation, um, but they can just be kind of aggravating to look at. Good to know. Um, I think that was all the questions that we had in the chat. Um, I know you mentioned soil mixes earlier, like, uh, so it's important you said just get like a sterile soil mix. Um, and is there any particular things that you need to look at when you're looking at them besides just, just look for a soil starting mix that's sterile? Is that the, the most important thing when you're looking for them? Yes, that, that really is. And typically, yeah, un unfortunately, just like everything else in life, I guess you get what you pay for sometimes, but typically your more, uh, your more expensive mixes are going to be the better ones to go with. 
I really wish, man, I, we'll, we'll have to figure out how to get it on more retail shelves. Cause I, I love, we use a, a, a mix called Berger number seven, and it comes in a three cubic foot bag, which is a big bag of mix. Uh, and it, that goes a very, very long way. Oh, this is a good question Nancy has. Do you need to sterilize your containers as well? Couldn't hurt. Uh, that being said, um, I I never have. <laughs> that doesn't mean that that I shouldn't. Uh, it, on, you know, I just, I, I had never had to do that. You know, typically I'll, I'll use my four inch pots and then I stack them up, you know, in a, you know, in the yard or somewhere, it probably gets 400 degrees out there during the summer. It probably cooks off most diseases, but it's it definitely now, if you ever do run into damp off or, you know, any of the other issues, Phytophthora or any of the other issues that, that can plague seeds, then absolutely before you're going to replant, sterilize everything. Um, you can use a bleach mixer, you can use peroxide, um, or the peroxide vinegar solution is a good is a good way to go. Um, but yes, if, if you have diseases, then you're going to need to sterilize. Um, but it's again, it's may not necessarily be it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> you, you couldn't go wrong by by sanitizing everything um, before seed starting. That, that's for sure. I just I, I've not had a problem when I didn't do it. Um, so there's a couple of questions about um, how do you spell the Berger and where do you find that at? Okay, that's a that's a good question. We unfortunately we use a wholesale supplier called Kenny Bonded Warehouse. Um, the only place I've ever seen it for sale is at a garden center out. I believe it's in Arlington, called Dones, D O A N S. And they actually said they were selling it. It's been a while since I've been out there, but that's the only place I've ever seen that that sold that mix locally. Um, you know, maybe if you have a favorite garden center, if you go ask enough times, maybe they'll start stocking it for you. Uh, Cause it is, it is available. It's uh, and it's spelled it's B E R uh, G E R. So it looks like burger, but it's a, the, French Canadian company and it's Berger is how they pronounce it. Awesome. Um, and let's see. Yes. Yeah. Ask for that. If we all ask for local garden centers, maybe we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll get it. <laughs> Start stocking it for you. That's right. A lot of places <laughs> will do that too. You know, if you, if you, especially if you have a good relationship with the local guys, they usually want to please you. So if you have a, uh, can say, go never hurts to ask. Um, Oh, okay. This is an interesting tip from Priscilla. She uh, read that if you're not using a heating mat, so you can use a folded towel under your st starting tray, uh, like if you're doing it indoors on a counter, and it provides ventilation under the tray, which increases warmth. That's a, that's an interesting idea. So I guess ventilation is another good question. Um, I've seen people have like fans and stuff going for their seed starts. Is that something that people need to, to worry about, like the ventilation part of it? Man, that again, it really depends on on your growing situation. Um, it's actually probably more important in a uh, if you're growing in a greenhouse than if you're growing in your house. Most homes, you're going to have a fan on or your air conditioning or your heater run in. So you're usually going to have that can vary, obviously, but uh, usually you have good airflow in a home anyway. But if you're in a greenhouse, um, you may need to throw a fan up uh, just to keep the air moving. It certainly would not hurt. Certainly wouldn't. And there's uh there's those you can get those cheap like clip on fans, uh, that are made in, and even some that are used for like the, the kinds that are used for like cooling computers and so forth. But like those down and dirty, um, I've seen them at Home Depot. Like those little clip on fans, you can just clip it onto something and just kind of keep it blowing over the top of the crop. Um, so Julie was asking if you, if big uh, tech urban farm sell starts to local gardeners, y'all ever sell all y'all starts at all? No, we, we don't, unfortunately. Um, that is not, not something we're, we're able to do. Um, he, you might want to contact them, Julie, because I think they do. Um, I, I know they sell it to some local organizations, but I'm going to put the link in for restorative farms because I, yeah. I think they sometimes yeah. sell, um, it's a really good um, organization that I think does sell starts to local people, so. And there's also, I, I, uh, 
the East Dallas Community Gardens used to sell starts at the uh, White Rock uh, Farmer's Market, the, the good local market, um, which I think they'll be back up in early March is when they start back up again. Um, so they should have, they usually set up and, and have some really nice stuff, some really interesting varieties. Um, so that's a, that's a great organization doing some really cool things to support also. So both of those, yeah. Um, both of those would be good, good places to support. Um, this is something I always struggle, um, with is when do I put my transplants out? Like when are they big enough to put out? Man, I'm glad you, I, I meant to, I meant to get into that. Yes. That's a, that's a, let's talk about kind of after care, so to speak. Um, so whether you're starting in a greenhouse or you're starting in your home, I recommend having a period of, uh, of adjustment. We call it hardening off, um, where you're going to get them slowly, but surely used to being out in the elements. You know, they've been pampered, they've been in a climate control, they've been in a nice warm greenhouse, and then all of a sudden you take them outside and that wind's just going to want to beat them to death or whatever, right? Uh, and that, that happens sometimes. So what I recommend is, you know, once you have some warm weather, um, find a spot in the shade and kind of gradually, you know, set them outside for, you know, a day, maybe even an evening uh, or two, and and you may end up having to kind of play a game where you, you have to set them outside some days and then, you know, you, a freeze is coming and you have to put them back inside. And that, that happens quite a bit. Um, but it's not usually too terrible, you know, just, just keep them somewhere where, where it's close enough where you can get them in and out for a couple of times. And uh, when to start planting, uh, it really depends on the weather. I know a lot of people li like to start their tomatoes and stuff in, in March. Um, especially if I'm producing my own transplants, I don't get in a big rush. This is part of, of where I could do a little bit more of a long, long term presentation. But a lot of times what I've done with my tomatoes, um, I'll seed start them like we're talking about, usually in four inch pots. They'll get up this tall or whatever. Um, and then I'll transplant them to a, another time to a larger container. Um, and I'll play that game for a while, sometimes a, a month or more where good sunny days, you know, uh, no freezing temperatures, you know, highs in the seventies or whatever, they're going outside. Um, then if we get some freezing or some, some, if we get close to freezing, they're coming back in my house and, I'll play that game for a couple weeks until I'm good and for sure that we're, we're frost free. Um, and by that time, I mean, a lot of times my plants, when I've transplanted them, when I go through this process, they're already blooming. <clears throat> and in some, some cases I've even had them with tomatoes set um, by the time that I go and transplant them into the garden. And yeah, they'll get a little leggy sometimes. That's okay for something like a tomato because you can bury them deep you know, and they have that uh, unique ability to uh, develop uh, roots up and down the stems. So I'll just bury them a little bit deeply and I'll go ahead and cage them, support them right away. And uh, that method has worked really, really good for me. So if you're willing to play that kind of inside outside game for a little while, you can get some really, really good results. And the same would be true with any of your warm weather vegetables, whether it's eggplants or peppers or you know, yard long beans or, or whatever, uh, warm, warm weather crops you're, you're trying to start. Um, in particular, those are the, the two that maybe the three, your eggplants, tomatoes, and, and peppers are the ones that take a long time. Um, I wouldn't even think about starting squash just yet. I wouldn't probably start that till mid February or so because they grow so quickly. Um, but those others that those three in particular take a while to get going. So I, I encourage people, if you're going to start those from seed to get those going pretty soon. Uh, um, yeah. And the hardening off, especially the, I, I'm glad you mentioned the shade thing. Cause I remember the first time I grew tomatoes my, on my own to transplant and I just stuck them outside and they got the photo bleaching, right? Because they weren't used to all that harsh yep. sunlight. And it was so sad. <laughs> I spent all that time raising them and then they just went bloop. <laughs> You know, and I should mention too, if you can put them in a place where they get a little break from the wind, 
that's great too. Those first few days, because uh, I've had just as many issues with them. Just getting, you know, the tips of the leaves will just shrivel up, and you know, just get blown to death on some of those windier spring days that we have. Um, but I also do want to mention too. Sometimes even if they even if they do get a little beat up, a lot of times as long as they have a good healthy root system, they can recover pretty quickly. So all is not necessarily lost if uh, if they get off to a rough start those first week or so out of the out of the greenhouse or out of the uh, out of the house. Um, do you? This is only happened to be one, and I suspect once I suspect it's because. Um, of the soil mix I used was not a sterile soil mix, but it, you ever have issues with like fungus gnats or any of those other things in your seed starts? Oh yeah, <laughs> we still, yeah, we get fungus gnats for sure. Um, it just, unfortunately it kind of comes with the territory. They're, they're very hard to control. They're, they're annoying uh, more than anything, but yeah, keeping the soil moisture under control is, is probably the best way to, uh, to, to mitigate them. Um, but they are, at least as, as far as I'm concerned, they're just more of a nuisance than anything. Um, I know it's not fun having them kind of buzz around your house, but typically, you know, spring comes and you get them out of the house and they kind of go on outside too. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, we continue, I mean, in our greenhouse growing, we, we have, we get fungus nets all the time. All right, so they don't really harm your seedlings though. No. It's, okay. <laughs> Um, are there any other pests that people have to watch out for, like starting seeds indoors or, um, yeah, you, ever... you know, um, there are, there, there definitely are. I mean, you can get, you can get things like aphids. That's probably the, the most common one that, uh, that you get when you're seed starting. I mean, you could get anything theoretically, but aphids is definitely one that we've, we've dealt with the most. Uh, one thing that's interesting um about that though and I, i've noticed this on our vegetable transplants and also our ornamentals which we still do grow ornamentals um i've had just some i mean colossally bad infestations of of aphids through the years when they're indoors and i put them outside and lo and behold like couple weeks go by and, and the, the problems sort of go away. Um, it's, it's almost like the, the insects can't harden off. You know, they get used to that cozy indoor setting and then they're outside and there's ladybugs out there and there's, you know, other predators and they don't like the, the, the conditions so well either. Um, that's not always the case. And it, if, if it gets bad enough, there's usually some, uh, usually some, some pretty low, uh, low tox ways that you can get rid of things, even including things like, you know, uh, Dawn dish soap sometimes is enough to, uh, or safer soap, you know, that you, you can get anywhere um, is a good way to get rid of things like aphids, good organic, organic methods. That's probably a little bit more of an issue for when you're growing on the scale that you're growing on versus like a home grower uh, scale, probably. Um, yes. Um, Oh, this is a good question Julie has. Do you have a favorite planting calendar for North Texas? Um, she usually uses Johnny's, which has a plug-in uh, date for the last frost date, um, and then tells you when to start indoors. Do you have a favorite calendar that you use for, or do you just do, go by with what you've done in the past? Or <laughs> Yeah, it's, we kind of have our own calendar now. Um, we've done it enough, but uh, A&M has a lot of good guides. Uh, the A&M AgriLife, um, they, they usually have a lot of really good seed starting guides, um, which are you know, obviously they've done a ton of, ton of research through the years to develop those calendars. So yeah, any of those you can, and you can look it up uh, through the A&M AgriLife website and type in your zone or your, your, your area um, and find out what to plant when. Really good, really good resource for sure. Uh, um, yeah, I dropped a link in for the one that I usually use from, that's for Dallas County um, from the AgriLife um, and there's also, um, I dropped in a link for their seed starting things that they recommend too. So it's basically a lot of stuff, the same stuff you said, but just if people need a visual reminder. Um, Absolutely. That's, that's a good guy. Uh, and then, you know, like we were talking about, the weather has been crazy recently, you know, growing tomatoes into December outdoors. Uh, so like, I like your waiting game thing where you bring it in and out. <laughs> that's, sometimes that's, you have to, yeah. 
it's kind of a pain to do that. Um, but man, it's effective. And like I say, the, the beauty part, that's, that's one thing that's nice. Like if you go ahead and pot it, you start them super early and then you get them into a large container. You're not missing any grow time. They're going to continue to grow those roots. They're going to continue to grow a nice top. Um, so even if you have to bring them back indoors, you've given them ample room to, to produce a large plant. And then that way you have a big, very pro, a, a plant that's ready to rock and roll as soon as you put it outdoors. So a lot of times it might be when I do that, I don't, I don't plant them out in the ground until April, you know? Um, and then I just kind of look at the forecast usually around April 1st and, you know, throw caution to the wind and, and, and go ahead and get them out as soon as I can at that point. Um, so I know we talked about like tomatoes, but like, I know you said you could start greens right now to plant outdoors, um, in early mm -hmm. spring. Um, how do you know, like, is there a certain height that you want them to be, um, before you plant them outdoors or a certain number of leaves or what's your general guide for when to plant things like leafy greens outside? Yeah, it, it kind of, you know, depends on the, the variety dependent, but if it's things like kale or collard greens or broccoli, um, you, they definitely need to have, a uh, at least a couple sets of what they call true leaves where, you know, not just the little seed cotties, the cotyledons that are going to emerge first, but when they've actually started to develop a seed, uh, a, a stem and they produce, you know, what they call real leaf, true leaves off of those stems. Um, you need to have at least two. I, I prefer to have three sets. Um, but a lot of that really has more to do with the root system than anything um then top growth so i'll monitor and I'll, i'm always careful about it but what i'll do i'll take my my four inch containers and i'll put my fingers over the top of the plant to where the stem is, is coming up between my fingers and i'll gently invert it and very carefully remove the pot and i'll look at the roots and if they're all the way to the edge of the cup and i've got a nice developed root ball um and the weather is appropriate then that's usually a good sign that it's, it's time to go ahead and get your greens in the ground. And uh, I mean, every year is a little bit different. There's been plenty of years when I was planting those types of crops and, you know, even mid February, some, sometimes, um, maybe have a blanket handy, you know, for get a couple of those, those cold, uh, colder, late, late winter days. Um, keep a frost blanket handy or, or some, some way to, to, to keep them protected, um, which is, you're going to have to do that, you know, almost any way if you want to keep them from, from freezing. Yeah. The, the frost cloth, you know, I got some right before the big freeze last year because I wanted to protect my onions that I just put in. Um, and I was like, Oh, this is way too thin, but actually my onions, I mean, were a little bit smaller this year than they normally are, but it actually did a good job of, you know, saving them from, <laughs> from that really cold temperature we had. I, I was amazed. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Cause that was, that was tough, man. Yeah. We, we ended up losing quite a bit and we lost power several times and yeah. It was oh a, yeah. I can, can, yeah. I can imagine with your hydroponic setup, it's probably just <laughs> worried about keeping things the plumbing from not freezing at that point. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, there's a question about recommendations for big tomato varieties that are most productive in Dallas. And I personally only grow the smaller tomatoes because I have issues with birds. <laughs> so I can never get the big tomatoes grown without birds pecking on them. But uh, are, are there any like big tomato varieties that you've had good success with, um, in producing here in the Dallas yes. area? Yes. Yes, there are. Um, there's a, there's a, I have kind of like a, a little core group that I plant every single year. Um, I usually do at least one early girl because it does produce a, you know, a week or so earlier than the rest. Um, so it's nice to kind of stagger your production, but I always plant an early girl. I always plant celebrity. Um, and then I normally will do a, uh, one, it's actually called, it's a uh, beef steak which has a great disease package, um, produces a, an abundance of nice, good sized tomatoes. I always plant those three. I've done better, better boy plenty of time. And then there's, if you're looking for a compact one, there's one called better bush, which stays very short. Um, it's a determinant, what they call a determinant variety. Um, so those are the ones that I, I grow out pretty much every year. Celebrities, the, probably the most consistent one that I've, 
that I've tried through the, for a long time. That's an old variety. And I've, I've grown that one for a number of years. And I would say, um, I don't, I haven't grown anything that's outproduced that one. And it's a good, big, full size, got a good, good tomatoey flavor too. Awesome. Are there any other questions for Drew while we have him here? He's a, <laughs> a great source of knowledge about these things. Um, and I have to put in a plug for it. If you're at the state fair um, this upcoming year, be sure to go visit the Big Tex sure. Urban Farms. It's an amazing setup um, that they have there. And they grow, I forget how many tons of food do y'all grow each year to, to, for the community? So we just, we just tallied up the, the numbers. We, we did, it was almost, it was like a little over in 23,000 pounds that we produced in 2000, in, uh, in 2021. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. And all those go to the food banks and to some other places. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really, is there any way that people can support you guys at Big Tex Urban Farms? Yeah. The easiest way is to just come to the fair. Um, we're funded 100% of our funding comes from the event itself. Uh, so that's, that's the best way is to just come out during the fair. Um, so a portion of what you, whatever you do, whether it's riding rides or, you know, buying a corn dog or you know playing games or whatever a portion of your of your of the proceeds go to fund our our project so that's it's an easy way to to, to help us <laughs> and, and y'all do provide some of the vegetables and stuff for the food vendors too right during the fair we do there's one vendor that we that we actually work with um yes so the, their trio on the green is what they're called and they're actually on the other side of the midway so we, we've done microgreens and basil and a few other some leafy greens for them for some of their entrees one of the one of the places that actually has real food <laughs> that you can get so, something that's, that's healthy if you, need, if you need a break from the corn dogs right <laughs> yes um and then julie asked um can you visit the farm when it's not state fair season not right okay. now um okay. we'll see where it goes um Right now, with the with the ever since quarantine, we we've kind of limited, we've sort of been forced into limiting our uh, our public events, um, and and right now, definitely, we we just got a memo that we're going to continue that into the new year for now. So hopefully, before long, um, we can start doing volunteer events and so forth again. Um, we loved doing that kind of thing. We, we were doing tours all the time. We, we had everything from Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops on up to local uh, college university students who were coming out and touring and, and working with us. So we, we hope to get back there soon, but we're, we're not quite there just yet. So uh, best way to, to, to keep up with this is on that, that bigtex.com. Um, there's a link to our farm project up on the main page and We'll, we'll, we'll put something out there when, when we start to do those events again. Awesome. Yeah, I was lucky. This was like years ago um, when we started the seed library. Drew let us come out and come see a setup. And it, it is, I think it's grown even since I've seen it last. So. <laughs> it has. It definitely has. We'll, we'll, I look forward to, to seeing friendly faces again. <laughs> um, and speaking of seed libraries, I know um, we do still have seeds at the seed library. Um, Yay. We don't have as many because, you know, uh, we talked about earlier the seed shortages. Um, so we didn't get our commercial seed donations um, like we have in the past because they just haven't had, as you know, the surplus to yeah. donate. Um, but we have gotten um, the good thing is we have gotten a lot of local donations. Um, and so we're hoping maybe this spring to have one of our seed swaps again so people can come out. And, you know, if you had a good seed saving thing or if you need some other seeds, um, we can do some seed swaps. Um, hopefully maybe um, in late February or early March. Um, again, like you mentioned, numbers. So hopefully <laughs> uh, hopefully numbers are looking good and we can do one of those seed swaps. Um, um, and also, if you haven't been to the sixth floor of the, um, the Dallas Public Library, the Central Library, um, it, it is open now, the sixth floor. It's beautiful. It's renovated. And that's where the seed library is living now again. So be sure to go out and check out the seed library. We do, like I said, we do have some available. We just don't have as many as we normally do, but we definitely do still have some available for everyone to come check out. That's fantastic. That that library is so great. I love it. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it's great inspiration if you need um, gardening books too. Check out yes. the fifth floor for the gardening book. <laughs> awesome. Okay, one last call for questions before you wrap up. Um, 
we talked about the importance of seed starting um, mixture, but our root, <laughs> and you're talking about how the roots are the important part of the plants, right? Because they take up all the nutrients and everything. Um, so next week's program will be, uh, we have a landscape architect who actually um, is a big proponent of healthy soil. So she's gonna talk a little bit about having, how to make your yard and your garden a little bit healthier by help, having good healthy soil. So wow. once you put those transplants out, right? <laughs> You want to have a good place to put them to. <laughs> good place, a good home. That's right. Uh, all right. Well, um, oh, sorry, two weeks from now. Thank you, Priscilla. Yes, you're correct. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I keep forgetting next week is um, uh, Martin Luther King Day. So, yes, we will not have a program um, on that day. But, yes, two weeks from now, you're correct. Um, and just for y'all who may not be able to make it to the Central Library, we do have satellite seed libraries at the MLK um, Library, um, which is not far from Fair Park. There's also um, one now at the Highland Hills location. You can get seeds at Mountain Creek and also the Lakewood location. So there's a bunch of different places you can get seeds if you aren't able to make it to the main library. <laughs> all right, Drew, thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure talking with you and learning all, picking your brain about all your knowledge about growing plants. So um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. And hopefully this has gotten you fired up for your spring gardening. Um, I know a lot of people don't think about starting plants until like March, which you can, like you said, Drew, you can start them then, but it's really good to start about, start thinking about them now and planning it out. Definitely. All right, well, everyone have a beautiful um, day. Try to get outside, wear your jacket though. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Enjoy the sunshine while we have it. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone.